Hi, everyone. We're back with another installment in a series that we've been doing with a friend of ours, Jose Campos. He's a pediatric surgeon in Chile. He represents a group of volunteers that does literature review within the Chilean Society for Pediatric Surgery. And he helped us choose these articles and go through them with us. And we call them case-based literature reviews. Basically, we choose a topic, we go through the latest literature about that uh, disease and see what new findings are out there. I'm Ellen and Cisco. I'm M. Tom Bash. And I'm Cecilia Higiena. And we're research fellows at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. And this is Stay Current Podcasts. So this week, we are talking about gastroschisis, and we're going to take Todd through a case. And as we always do, we're going to go through some of the latest literature. If you want to read along, you can take a look at the links below the media player. We'll have all of the articles linked below. All right. So we're seeing a patient prenatally. The ultrasound is consistent with gastroschisis at 20 weeks. And so, Todd, if you were seeing this patient in clinic, what would you tell them about when they should deliver? My general inclination is to let things go natural. As long as the baby's healthy, you can deliver at full term vaginal and at whatever institution, as long as there's another institution within a reasonable range. However, something tells me that recent literature suggests that it actually is better to deliver earlier. All right, we'll see what the literature says. Jose, what do you tell patients? To be completely honest, before preparing this case, in terms of timing, just the most natural thing, let them get to term delivery. There's no benefit of C-section or vaginal delivery. If we deliver too late, one, we get an increased chance of stillbirth after week 39. And also with the late exposure to the amniotic fluid, you get a lot of bowel morbidity. But on the other hand, if you deliver them too early, you get all the mortality from premature delivery, respiratory distress, and et cetera. I think this is a question worth exploring. So why don't we hear about the article we brought today? The most recent literature is from earlier this year in uh, July 2022. This is an article out of the European Journal of Pediatric Surgery. It's called Elective Delivery versus Expectant Management for Gastroschisis, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. And they took a look at 10 different studies. Two of them were, were randomized controlled trials. Eight of them were observational cohort studies. And overall, there were a total of 629 infants included in all of the studies. They We're trying to answer this question of if elective delivery is recommended or is expectant management okay for patients with gastroschisis. They did this by grouping patients into two groups and did kind of two different analyses. First, they took a look at patients who were electively delivered between 34 and 35 weeks and compared those to the expectant management. And then they did a second comparison looking at patients electively delivered between 36 and 37 weeks, again, comparing to the expectant management or the control group. And the outcomes they looked at were regarding length of stay in the hospital, TPN days, bowel morbidity, sepsis, time to first feeding, short gut syndrome and ventilator days, and mortality. And they found that in the first comparison, 34 to 35 weeks compared to expectant management, there was really no difference, no benefit to delivering early. But in the group that was delivered electively between 36 and 37 weeks, they found a decreased incidence of bowel morbidity and TPN usage when compared to the expectant or control group. So they conclude that 36-37 week elective delivery may be optimal, at least based on the findings in this meta-analysis. This is getting to that sweet spot in which you maximize the benefit between these two risks, too late stillbirth and too early neonatal death, secondary to preterm delivery. The previous trials were too extreme in delivering babies at 34. This article proposing a change in practice to deliver at 36, 37. I think I would discuss this with the uh, obstetrics teams, with the neonatal team, and I'd definitely go for it with this type of evidence. There must be other articles before this one saying the same, because I remember Jack Langer saying that 36 weeks was optimal. Yeah, in a podcast about three years ago in 2019, we had a discussion with Dr. Jack Langer of Sick Kids about gastroschisis and other abdominal wall defects. And he said then that his recommendation was for patients to deliver electively at 37 weeks, actually. As I think other literature has suggested, vaginal delivery is okay here. We don't need to go for a C-section. My question of all the things you listed, Jose, in the beginning about all the benefits of early delivery 
The one thing that wasn't mentioned was, is it easier to get the bowel reduced when they're at a certain age? Is it easier at 34, 35, 36? Is it easier when they're bigger? Because everything grows. So the bowel grows, but so does the domain. So the question is, is there more space to put stuff in the bigger they get, or is there more space to put stuff in the smaller they are? It's a great question. It's either you have a bigger space or you have a healthier bowel. Because we do know that the longer we keep the bowel exposed to amniotic fluid, the thicker the peel and the more dilated the bowel it gets. So my impression would be it's not like the baby's getting bigger and we have more space to put it. It's just that we have a healthier bowel. But that's just my opinion. The article did not mention this at all. That's a fascinating point that it's not necessarily the ratio of the bowel size to the space. It's that as the bowel soaks in amniotic fluid, it gets a peel and it gets bigger and thicker and more distended and more dilated. So it's harder to reduce. Okay. So the next question, Todd and Jose. If the baby's born well, we have no necrosis, obvious ischemia, perforation, there's not a lot of peel or matting, would you recommend attempting an immediate closure or would you prefer to place a silo? I do immediate closure attempt unless the baby is not perfect. If there's any reason not to, I don't push it. I try to go ahead and push it all in. If I feel like I can't do it easy, then I put a silo in. I use that spring-loaded silo. But if I can get it all placed in, then I put in a sutureless closure. What about you, Jose? Yeah, so I was taught to always get the bowel in as soon as possible. That was better for the baby, better for the bowel. We're describing here a case with no necrosis, no ischemia, no perforation. I don't see necessarily the point of rushing in and getting all the bowel inside, or at least I'm willing to hear other options. And I think that's what the second article is about. Okay, so the second article is called Management of Gastroschisis uh, Results from the NET Study. It's a study done with prospective study database from Great Britain, Ireland, and Canada. They looked patients with gastroschisis that had primary closure versus the one that had a silo place. There was 671 patients with primary closure and 587 with silo. And those patients were divided in two groups. The first group were the ones that had intestines without perforation, necrosis, or matting. And the second group were the ones that had one of those things. And what they found is that patients without necrosis, matting, or perforation with silo had fewer gastrointestinal complications. And if the patients that had necrosis, matting, or perforation was worse with the silo, basically patients without intestinal lesions had better outcomes with primary silo. And remember, these were not patients that were put in a silo because the bowel didn't fit. It was a primary silo strategy. When they assign gastrointestinal complications, they're talking about mechanical bowel obstruction, a new intestinal perforation, unplanned resection, compartment syndrome, and enterocolitis. So in this group, they got, of course, more operations, more TPN days and higher infection risk. But the benefit is that you can reduce these very severe gastrointestinal complications in up to 75% of patients. You use the primary silo strategies. Was it always the same team always did silo and the other teams always did an attempt at early closure? No, the treatment allocation is not standardized. And that's one of the drawbacks of these studies. We definitely need more data on this. If someone's willing to do both, the reason they would ever do silo first is that they felt concerned enough to not put, push the ball in or they didn't want to come in. Those are the two reasons I can see why. So if they're concerned about the baby and they would lean towards a silo, then you would expect that the silo would have more complications because those are the ones that they're more concerned about. So they would potentially have more complications, but it's the opposite. It's the one they pushed in that had the more complications. Those were ones they weren't worried about. They were pushing it all in and they still had higher complications, which does suggest that we are probably being too aggressive in pushing bowel back in and causing a problem. That's what I'm taking from that. And it's not a randomized controlled trial. I think propensity score matching is as close as we can get with a retrospective study to a randomized controlled trial. I tell you, this article could change my mind. I know it's comfortable to look at a closed baby during the first postoperative day, but I'm not sure those are the outcomes we should be looking at. And this article is looking at the outcomes I think should be looked at, which are long-term 
gastrointestinal complications, not just an easy primary reduction. In the last few years, for some reason, we have seen babies get bowel ischemia when their bowel is pushed in too fast. I used to always push everything back in. And now I don't think there's a problem with just putting on a silo, using the silo to see if it easily goes in without force. On the other hand, we know that in the first 24 hours, bowel swells, more fluid develop. And so is it better to get it in or leave it out for that to happen? I don't know. But based on this, I may be more lean, leaning towards putting a silo on than pushing it in. All right. We have two more questions to go and at least two more articles to talk about. But this is interesting. And I've only seen a few gastroschisis patients myself, but it does seem like usually our main goal has been to try to reduce right away and not do silos only if we have to. Um, so this is definitely interesting to hear. Okay, so say we do decide to just try primary closure. Would you request general anesthesia, Todd, or would you try to do it without? I am the outlier here. I believe we should give sedation. I know that everyone says this is overkill. You do not need it. You can do it without sedation. I think it's cruel. We do sedation to drain an abscess, but we don't do sedation to shove bowel back inside the abdomen under pressure. I don't think it's right. I'm sure we can do it. I'm not sure we should. And personally, I think I have better success and it's safer to the bowel when I have the baby sedated. That's my personal opinion. And I know I'm a minority in that. I don't think you're a minority. I think most people in Chile would do it in an operating theater with endotracheal intubation and a general anesthesia. And again, I was told if you want to increase your chances of primary closure and primary repair, you need to do it under general anesthesia. And that's how I've been doing it. And I've seen bedside reduction with minimal sedation without general anesthesia. And I think it's amazing how you can do this in 15, 20 minutes. And I'm hoping we'll see the benefits of this strategy when we dissect the following paper. Our paper is now to be or not to be. Is routine endotracheal intubation necessary for successful bedside reduction? and primary closure of gastroschisis. This is a paper from Canada, and they wanted to describe the success rate of primary gastroschisis closure with and without endotracheal intubation and evaluate whether differences exist in closure success rates and post-op parameters, including ventilator days, hospital days, and complication between patients who underwent primary bedside gastroschisis closure with and without endotracheal intubation. They used the Canadian Pediatric Surgery Network dataset, which was collected between 2005 and 2017 for all patients undergoing attempted reduction and closure. More than 1,300 patients were eligible, 386 of them underwent attempted closure at the bedside, and 625 of them underwent attempted closure in the operating room. The rate of successful closure was similar for non-intubated and intubated patients, 84% versus 86%, and total duration of mechanical ventilation was significantly shorter in the non-intubated group. There is no significant difference in length of hospital stay, time to enter feeds, or wound infection, but the only disadvantage that we can tell that non-intubated group of patients had was bowel obstruction, which was 12.2% compared to 5.5% for the patients who are intubated. And the primary closure rate did not reach statistical significance in between patients who underwent primary bedside closure with intubation and those who were not intubated. And these results suggest that two groups had similar overall outcomes. So the team conclude that it is safe and reasonable to attempt bedside closure without intubation in otherwise healthy infants. I don't agree with their interpretation of how to apply those data to clinical practice. Just because so, there's no difference, then why not intubate? <laughs> so what is your biggest concern, Todd? Is it pain or discomfort or anything else? It's a good question, but I think that it's distressful for the baby to do this without any sedation. Yeah, but Todd, would you change an uncomfortable baby for half of the ventilator days and a higher chance of not being ventilated at That's all? That's a good point. I think I would. I don't think primary reduction is our main goal here. But having less ventilator days, I think it's definitely a good outcome to pursue. What I'm worried about in this article is that there's an increased chance of bowel obstruction, more than double. If general anesthesia is giving us less ventilator days, but is making us miss bowel obstruction that was previously there, then I I think I would intubate the child. I would think it's because you're doing, when they are not sedated 
the process of pushing it back in becomes much more traumatic. Might be. I think we don't know yet. They need to explain that more and understand what did they find from a bowel obstruction? Was it something missed or was it adhesive? If it's adhesive, I'm guessing it's because it's a more of a struggle to get it reduced when the baby's awake. Okay, last question for this case. If we've managed to reduce all of the bowel, do you prefer sutured or sutureless closure? Sutureless. I've always done sutured closure because I'm always used to have a baby intubated in theater. So why don't just go and put stitches in? But I've seen sutureless closure and I think it's beautiful technique. I'm really looking forward to testing it. Okay, so our last article that we're featuring here is from the Journal of Pediatric Surgery a couple of years ago in 2020, and it's from the Midwest Pediatric Surgery Consortium. It's called Sutureless versus Sutured Abdominal Wall Closure for Gastroschisis, Operative Characteristics and Early Outcomes from the Midwest Pediatric Surgery Consortium. And this was a retrospective review of patients with gastroschisis at 11 centers from 2014 to 2016. They took a look at 315 neonates with uncomplicated gastroschisis and compared the patients with sutured versus sutureless closure. About almost 80% of them were sutured, underwent sutured closure, with the remaining approximately 20% undergoing sutureless closure. The each group was then broken down between primary versus uh, delayed closure after silo. And they found that sutureless closure patients were associated with less general anesthesia, less ventilator use and time, less time from birth to clo- final closure, less antibiotic use, and fewer surgical site and deep space infections. So over all are associating sutureless abdominal wall closure with you know a lot of benefits like I just listed when compared to patients who underwent sutured closure. What about umbilical hernia? There was a paper by Robert Baird. He was at Montreal when he wrote the paper. That was probably in around maybe 2015. So he showed lower umbilical hernias in the sutureless group, which makes no sense. Maybe because you let it naturally close versus a hernia from trying to bring things together artificially. Then there was another study from Stanford. Matthias Bruzzoni refuted that paper and said there was worse outcomes in the sutureless closure. And now there's this paper. So it keeps going back and forth. There's actually a more recent article from the MWPSC taking a look at umbilical hernia repairs after gastroschisis. And the sutureless closure was associated associated with increased umbilical hernia incidence in these patients, but the majority of them, like most of the general population, did not require surgical repair. So overall, they don't seem to lead to more need for surgery. Cool. And just a comment on this article, I see the benefit of less ventilator, less general anesthesia. So of course, these are not direct consequences of the suture less group. It's not that putting sutures in will give you those benefits. But I think we're seeing the indirect benefits of not getting a general anesthesia. I'm not sure if they control for that variable in this article. For all babies, I will go ahead and place a silo. And then right when I put it in, I can gently lift up on the silo, maybe push the bowel a little bit to see if it just easily slides in to the level of the umbilicus. That's rare. So usually what I would do is at that point, put on an umbilical tape to tie the silo. I think putting a silo and just waiting for the next day or two and have it done progressively, it's perfectly good idea. And it's well backed up by these articles. Then I will take off the silo at the bedside and cover it with a plastic sutureless closure. I don't really think the discussion about sedation or anesthesia is relevant here now because if you put the silo on you're not forcing it in so that discussion may be even off the table okay so todd and jose gave us their summaries We took a look at patients with gastroschisis, reviewed some of the latest literature, looking first at the question of elective versus expectant delivery. Sounds like the consensus is that near-term elective delivery is probably recommended. Uh, We don't need to deliver any sooner than that. Then we took a look at initial silo reduction compared to primary closure. And at least according to the NET study from Britain and Canada, They found that patients with uncomplicated gastroschisis who underwent initial silo reduction actually had fewer gastrointestinal complications than those who underwent primary closure initially. So something to think about when deciding if a patient needs immediate primary closure. We took a look at the need for general anesthetics 
for closure of gastroschisis, and there doesn't seem to be any concerns with doing it without general anesthesia. They actually have fewer ventilator days, but some people like Todd are still not sure we want to subject the babies to the pain and, and discomfort of a gastroschisis closure without sedation. And then finally, we took a look at the sutralis versus sutrid closure, and here it sounds like sutralis closure is associated with a lot of benefits. Awesome. Well, let us know what you think. If you have a topic you want a recent literature review on, let us know. Send us a message or leave a comment. Jose is always excited for more of these conversations. Uh, look out for the next one. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on social media. Leave a reading or a review wherever you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And as always, don't forget to download the Stay Current in Pediatric Surgery app for more of these podcasts, videos, and a lot more. I'm Ellen and Cisco. I'm M. Tom Bash. And I'm Cecilia Higiena. And this is the Stay Current Podcast.